What you're hired for is to help us. Does that seem clear to you? To help us, not to fuck us up. To help men who are going out there to try to earn a living, you fairy, you company man. Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach, and um, I had to uh, calm down before I could cover this, but before I do, first kill graphic novel, link is in the description, and Transformers, I'm just reading this for fun. So, um, <coughs> a couple days, a... Um, retailer in Florida put out a list of his prediction that the direct market had two years left and here's what he would do to change things. Here's what the industry should do if they want to survive. I covered it obliquely in a video. It was more about covering the idea that, hey, your list is fine, but it's much too late. They should have made these changes four or five years ago. But it created a groundswell of hatred from a group that I have to name. Um, I've just been calling them the, the DBPG, Dumb Bitch Peer Group, because they're not the powers that be. They're not the people in charge. They're not the Illuminati. They're just this group of mostly older people, and I need to speak about that a little bit more as well, who are kind of friends. Valerie D'Arezio uh, did a tweet thread a few weeks ago talking about it. It's kind of this peer group, peer group, <laughs> peer group that um, uh, they know each other, but... It's always strange to me when you see these people tweet at and about each other. And it's like, oh my gosh, just saw Dean Haspiel. It's been so long. And I'm like, you both live in New York City. Like you both constantly mention it. If you're friends and you live in the same city, how come you only see each other at New York Comic Con? The point is they're not actually friends. They are vague allies it's a very unique obviously when you're trying to quantify something you use established models oh are they co-workers well sometimes but not really are they friends i don't think these people have friends they uh, they are if you say they are in a cohort that implies some sort of loyalty to each other they're just kind of I don't know. It, it's a very strange thing. So the other thing about uh, older people is when you are being given advice, especially from someone who wants to say, oh, I've been in the industry for decades, you need to know their age, their actual age, close to it. Uh, so um, spoiler, Gail Simone is not 48 years old, like she claims. She's much closer to 60. Because something happens when people get to their late 50s, early 60s, they are in single digit, pretty much five years or less, before they can get to retirement. So, uh, slow charger. Okay, thank, thanks for that pop-up. Um, uh, so, um, they don't have to live with the consequences of what they say. They can just call the customers Nazis all the time. Hey, they had a, a movie deal 10 years ago. They made a lot in comics 30 years ago. They bought some stock. They bought some property. They're fine. So they can just say, hey, uh, if you like the Punisher, you're a Nazi. <laughs> like they can just say whatever the fuck they want. They're like, I say we need more black lesbians writing everything. There's no consequences to their action. They've already secured the bag. Uh, or they are, if they don't have a lot of savings, they are close enough that they can just kind of limp to, I think, 62, you can start getting your benefits. Although if you start taking them when you are 62, you make less, like, forever. <coughs> but anyway, she put uh, this article out and um, apparently went on a real tear on... Uh, social media, Twitter. So um, 
I've talked a lot about how I really value uh, my calm friends. Cat uh, Williams says, get yourself some white friends. I say, get yourself some calm friends, especially if you can be riled up fairly easily. Those are the people who will tell you like, hey, chill. Don't take everything so close. Wait some time. The calmest, most mild-mannered, most intellectual friends I have that are aware of comics were absolutely livid. So Jimmy Pomiati shares the, uh, I guess it's an opinion piece on ICV2 by the, uh, uh, I believe he owns a chain. So he says, uh, and it's been covered in lots of videos. It's, it's pretty bland stuff. The only thing that's not bland and has been said a million times is him putting a date that like it's got two years left. So Jimmy Palmiotti says on the nose, and then he gives the link for the, um, I think I said this a million times. Um, I don't think Jimmy Palmiotti is a bad guy at all. I think he's really dumb, like, like really dumb, like, like standardized testing dumb. So I don't think he knows what on the nose means. Uh, I think he means like, I agree with this or this is accurate. On the nose is not actually the proper term to use when you are agreeing. Um, so uh, he says on the nose and then Heidi, who is in her 60s and supposedly a journalist, says retailers I've talked to think this is more, quote, on the butt. He said on the nose, so she said on the butt. These people are both in their 60s. Two people I know used to shop at his store and complain they didn't get their pull list pulled. The issues he's talking about are real, but Marvel and Dynamite make variants because retailers buy them, not the reverse. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, stop, stop, stop. You just said a store doesn't uh, fulfill their own pull list, doesn't set aside the books that are ordered. Don't just move on to random shit. That was a pretty damning accusation. Um... So then this guy whose job is the polis, he says, as the guy who orders the comics at Coliseum, I take umbrage with your claim that, quote, two people I know didn't get their polis pulled, unquote, like shortages and damages never happen. That's like me saying two people I know think comics beat just regurgitates press releases. Ouch. And then again, very calm. Very intellectual guy. This drove him insane. She goes, fair enough. I was surprised at how many people complained about this, to be honest. Everyone talks about how pre-ordering is important and not getting what you pre-ordered seems like yet another problem. Whoa, time out, bitch. You made a direct accusation. Uh, what did you say? Two people I know, not I heard of two people, two people I know. When you know people, you know their names. You can go like, Oh, hey, uh, he says, besides, you know, damaged stuff or stuff they don't receive, like, they fulfill their, their pull list. So, which is it? You said they don't. Like, fair enough is just like, oh, fuck, I thought nobody was going to call me on my bullshit. It's been 24 hours. I've cursed a lot in my head. In this video, I think I've only cursed uh, once so far. But, um, uh, Heidi and... Whoever is going to let her know. You're the bad guy. You're the villain. Uh, my side, which is very, like, uh, fractured at the time. Yes, occasionally assholes. More often, just tiresome or annoying. Your side tries to get people to kill themselves. Your side has a retailer give his honest take on the state of the situation. He sees the sales. He has to pay the tax on the sales. He has to file the taxes. He does the orders. And he says things are really bad. To which you start to spread a rumor to discredit him. And we're going to see more of that. So after she just totally drops her... Slander? Okay. Spider-Man movie. What, is he, what does J. Jonah Jameson say? 
Slander is spoken libel. Okay, so it would be libel. Uh, because you're uh, a lying piece of shit and you made that up. And I know that because you didn't even try to defend it or tag the people in. It's like, oh, hey, at so-and-so and at so-and-so number two. Uh, maybe you want to talk to this guy and iron out your issues. Fair enough. It's just like, fuck. Okay, I'll just lie about something else later. So then this guy who is, again, these sides are not perfect sides like football teams, but this guy is, <coughs> as far as I know, generally on Heidi's side. And he says, Heidi, I'm sorry, but I feel we all need to set aside the constant war against the, quote, bad people, unquote, and be honest about the problems. Even so, going to battle with, quote, I like her, maybe that two people didn't get their comics once, unquote, is not the juicy data we need. Damn. <laughs> Damn. Imagine you are a journalist and you lie, lie in a way that is so fucking obvious that when you get clapped back upon, you immediately just drop it. You're like, oh shit. And then someone on your own side is like, this ain't it, chief. So let's get to the actual article. And we're going to see this type of dishonesty. And we're going to see just mainly a bunch of like the Daily Show circa 2003 tactics, which is uh, someone gives their opinion. And they make a bunch of statements. They might make 30 different statements. And then you find one statement, not even the full statement, like a fraction of it. And you say, oh, I'm going to hammer on this. And then if I can cause any doubt on this sentence fragment, I'm then going to say, since I cast doubt on that sentence fragment, I have discredited that sentence, your entire uh, blog, and you. You're a liar forever because I argued one point in a pedantic manner. So it starts off and it's just, I've spoken about how nothing disgusts me more than 50 year old men uh, in front of toys complaining about Snow White. I think there is a flip side to that. Nothing is more disgusting than sarcasm from a woman in their 60s. And somehow this is under the topics of business news, retailing and marketing, top news, and it's just an AARP woman lying to protect her uh, DBPG, dumb bitch peer group. Not even really friends, not exactly allies. It's, um, I guess they kind of back each other sometimes. Um, if you ever wonder why, like, there will be, like, New York Comic Con, and all of a sudden you are reading more about Dean Haspiel than you ever have for the rest of the year, it's because he is in that peer group. So they're going to pump up his stuff and he's going to mutually promote them and stuff like that. So the title by a woman in her 60s is Retailer Warns That Comics Are Dying Again. So, uh, uh-oh. Oh, Jesus. Sometimes I'm going to be quiet, but I'm only quiet um, on the outside in my head I'm screaming so uh-oh comics are dying again we went a good while without being dying but it's official oh fuck they are dying the diagnosis was delivered by retailer Phil Boyle in a piece at IC ICV2 entitled comic stores 2023 it's nearly 2024 and I'm more than concerned Boyle runs a Florida based chain of shops Coliseum of Comics which is the largest comics and games retailer in the Southeast. He's a comics veteran, a smart businessman, and certainly someone who knows the industry. Uh, okay, so then she just recounts it, and it's, you know, basic stuff. Um, you'll recognize some of the same warnings and anxieties expressed by Brian Hibbs. Um, ind indeed, Hibbs took to Facebook for his own response, one that literally, literally sent him to the ER when he began to feel ill while writing it. So first of all, feel better and take care of yourself, Brian. We need you. What are fractured 
discourse at the moment, lack of sales charts, and general weirdness in the world, it's a little hard to discern the reality of where we're at with this. I sat in a room at the Javits Center for eight hours and heard all the smartest people in comics talking about the future of comics, and nobody seemed to think the industry is dying. But I'm not going to deny that there is a lot of anxiety and, then she puts this in parentheses, apparently bad sales out there, and retailers are concerned. And their concerns are certainly valid. The recent closure of one of iconic, uh, of one iconic comic shop in New York City and announced closure of two more iconic shops in LA are not good news. And add to the doom and gloom. Okay, so you've described nothing but an industry that's in total crisis. And yet you're doing it in this cutesy pie, sing-song way like, oh, <laughs> Boyle's concerns are the usual. Too many variant covers, periodical prices are too high, prices undercut by online retailers. Oh, this is going to be a long video, by the way. Too many new characters and poor quality stories. I can't argue with any of the, those, honestly. They are realistic concerns. Okay, so your title is literally sarcasm. You've described a depressed and diminished industry. You've established the credentials of the guy writing the podcast and then said... All these things he said are demonstrably true. Let's go on. The most controversial part of Boyle's warning was the part where he took up familiar Seagate complaints that comics are, quote, proselytizing, unquote. Then he says the same thing has been said a million times. Um, I will never stop to point out how utterly childish it is that this corrupt journalist uh, acts like a mean girl in middle school. It's not a magic fucking word. Just type comic skate there. Again, I called her a cunt. Okay, that was that was that was the that was the silence. I was calling her a cunt in my head. Um, I'll say what I always say when this argument is made. Have you ever read Silver and Bronze Age comics, a golden era that many pine for? The villains were Richard Nixon, giant capitalist corporations, Roxxon, and sinister government agencies. Stan Lee and Jack Kirby filled their stories with all kinds of messages about tolerance and diversity. And it was also about killing every commie you see. Like, go read the first five years of Marvel Comics. They were just smashing commies in the face on the regular. Mainstream comics have always been... Da, 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 da. So they always do this bit, and it's basically like, comics have always been political. And then they name the same five stories in the first 40 years of publication. Actually, closer to the first... No, it, yeah, 40 years. Uh, which, if anyone had any knowledge of the English language, you wouldn't say comics have always been political. You would say, more accurately... Comics have occasionally been political. Uh, as for gender swapping, Christ almighty, have you ever heard of the Marvel family of the Superman? Of the, okay, so, so what happens is he makes this complaint. He says the characters are iconic for a reason. The movies never got traction until they leaned into what, the char what made the characters decades long successes. Change is good for story, but inevitably you need to touch base with what brought them. Gender swaps, Sexual orientation changes and outright changes to who's in the suit are short-term headline grabbers, but without long-term sales with very few exceptions. Again, this is not just a retailer of several decades. This is an owner of a chain of successful stores. He knows what the fuck he's talking about. But did you notice again, this is not the whole sentence. This is not, uh, what do they say, a hill to die on? He mentions gender swaps sexual orientation changes, and outright changes. So they decided to use the Daily Show tactics. Oh, gender swaps. Oh, okay. So then they're going on. It's like, uh, 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 John, I just went through the solicits for the last few months, and I cannot find one single instance of DC or Marvel currently push publishing a book starring a gender-swapped character. Okay, you already moved the goalposts. He did not say starring characters. He just mentioned several different types of changes, one of which was gender swaps. We just saw Derek Robertson illustrate 
Max's pitch to swap genders. It's not crazy to imagine if you've switched sexuality on so many characters over the last couple years, characters that were straight for decades of publishing history, it's not some crazy thing to talk about gender swaps, which have happened to not Superman and Batman, and he never said they did. So he talks about, it's like, oh, I looked at all these characters and they're not gender swapped. I don't know what kind of crazy stuff is happening in your brain. Well, he was uh, speaking honestly and you are speaking dishonestly and cherry picking. It's The Daily Show in 2003. Then Heidi even has to admit that there is gender swaps. But it's in the MCU, except for those MCU characters are based on what happened in Marvel Comics like 10 years ago and you know that. Uh, so, um, uh, here's Brian Hibbs again, and he says, uh, now I fully and completely disavow the parts of this opinion that are culture war stuff. Sales have been dropping in lefty ass San Francisco too, and I don't perceive it's because LGBTQ characters or gender swapping or any of the other bits that Phil undercut his own argument with. So it's not about him undercutting his argument. It's about all these pros and Rich Johnson and Heidi McDonald intimidating a store owner for telling the truth based on years of sales and decades of experience. We saw the same thing happen in 2017 at that retailer summit where uh, Rich specifically broad brushed all of the retailers there as bigots based on, again, sentence fragments. I believe the only actual direct quote was just freaking females in uh, quotations. Again, not attributed to anyone, which you could do. It's not like there were 1,000 retailers in there. It sounds like there were a couple dozen. You can have someone say, and then Joe Bob from Joe Bob's Comics said freaking females. Okay, first of all, anytime something is limited all the way to a sentence fragment and not the entire sentence, including the context, I will almost say 100% of the time that is a malicious tactic by someone to, to discredit someone falsely. Why would you quote a sentence fragment and not the entire sentence? This is how people talk on the East Coast. He could have said, and why won't freaking Marvel make more freaking comics for my freaking females who are there to spend their freaking money? Like it could have literally been that. So every retailer got the message. If you complain in any way, you're going to be labeled as a bigot and it's going to affect you for years, possibly the rest of your life. So everyone just shut up and even worse comics were produced and now all these stores are going out of business or they are unopening, which is a phrase I created, where you're a comic store, but uh, you no longer rely on comic sales in any way, shape or form. In the telephone book or whatever, on Google, you will be listed under the category of comic book shops, but you are a geek bodega. So then Brian Hibbs just goes through his equally boring list. Um, and then we get a, some more uh, Death by Hyperlink uh, reference to the um, David Gabriel meeting with retailers. Um, and... Uh, I don't know, trying to cast uh, aspersions on Mark Millar because he decided to post a funny picture. And then he, uh, I'll cover this more. I'll do a specific um, video on this. Um, so then, okay, so again, nothing more <laughs> off-putting than a woman in her 60s using sarcasm. Um, so then there's this is weird thing. It's like, to me, a more germane question is, why does today's comics market not allow new characters to catch on? Wine, Claremont, and Cockrum did a great job with the X-Men, but it was hardly the single burst of creativity in comics history. Why'd you mention three white men, Heidi? Are you a white nationalist? So, here's the deal. People used to get hired based on merit, and now they get hired because they're autistic lesbians. Do you remember when... Vita did a tweet thread all of all of the OCs she had created while writing the X books and it was 10 different characters 
and they were all the same. They were all Vita. They were all vaguely ethnic and queer. Their personalities were described, and it was like, shy until she gets to know you. Really likes geek stuff. Loyal to her friends. All ten characters had that description. Not in the exact same words, but the point was the same. You used to hire people on talent. And in a country that was then majority white and in a field that had mostly male fans, just a law of averages is going to lead to mostly white men being hired. And when these white men are hired, not because they have white skin, not because they're male, not because they're straight, but because they have good ideas, and as soon as you run out of good ideas, you're out the door, it behooved them to come up with some pretty goddamn good ideas. Mark Millar did not start his career under the luxury that Vita Ayala had. Where it was like, just show up and say anything, write anything, we will print anything. Just lesbians eating scones in a field. That's good enough for an X-Men story. So I'll cover Mark Millar's idea, but basically it's incentivize pros by splitting profits between the company and the pro if the sales are above, I forget what it is, like 50,000 units. So... um. While I was writing this in the middle of the night, Miller was just getting up to hit the links, apparently, and he's been generous in giving his advice to the industry during this crisis. So I've been watching his Twitter thread roll out in real time. I think everything in this is kind of gonzo, but hell, let's grease the wheels with some hot takes. Wasn't a hot take, bitch. A bunch of men are about to attempt to fix the problems that you and your dumb bitch friends created. Now, we know you're not going to help because you created them, but you can at least shut the fuck up while they attempt to help people. Anyway, before I go, first kill graphic novel link is in the description. Thanks for watching. Bye.